push button is it? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. No, oh, spoilers. Sorry. Back to my face. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. There we go. <laughs> this is me. Ah! This is me. This is not me. This is me. Uh, I'm Kate. I'm a games writer. Sometimes I make games. Sometimes I do talks about games. And that's why I'm here today. And you can follow me on Twitter, and you should, because I like Twitter and having lots of followers. So my talk today is called How to Win, Friends. I had to come up with it on very late notice. It's meant to be a pun? Oh, whatever. It doesn't really have much to do with the talk itself, but it's a nice title. What I'm actually going to be talking about is local multiplayer, which I guess friends win. Yeah, it works, right? Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm going to be talking about local multiplayer, why I like it, why you should like it, where it came from, and what it's doing today. So, local multiplayer began a long time ago when, basically when games first began, it was all about sitting on the floor with your siblings. These are not my siblings. I've never met these children in my life. <laughs> but it was, it's an illustrative photo. Uh, I imagine you all seem of the sort of age where you might have had a SNES or, a, or an N64 and you'd cycle around to your friend's house and you'd bring your controller and you'd play Smash Bros and have a great time and you'd conveniently forget to plug in the Player 2 controller. Oops, oh no, you lost, it's not my fault. But then, we had the Xbox 360 era, which is what I'm going to call it, which is probably not what it's actually called, but it's all brown and it's all online because the internet happened. And then we, we sort of forgot to go around to our friends' houses and have fun with them. And we just played online with sometimes friends, mostly strangers, who hate your mum for some reason. And it was nice. And it was, it was a new thing. And, you know, local multiplayer became a bit of a faff. You know, you had to take all these cables and you had to plug everything in and you had to have friends. And so people just sort of... It, it went out of fashion a little bit. But now... It's fashionable again, and I blame indies and Nintendo, as I do with most things. So, <laughs> here are some local multiplayer games that I like. As you can see, I've Googled local multiplayer. I don't know why anyone would do that, but I have. And these, these are all very good games, except I don't know what this one is, but has anyone heard of that one? Is it good? It's good! Great! I like all the rest of them, so... That's my mark of approval, if you care. I tried to get one where it had indie games and Nintendo, which is surprisingly hard, which probably means my point is wrong. <laughs> Let's not think about that. Um, so this is where local multiplayer is at right now. Um, some of it is local multiplayer in the sense of uh, Splatoon. That's not lo local multiplayer, is it? Like, is it two-player? OK. Good. Whew. Should have done my research. Anyway, Broforce is great for local multiplayer. It's a cooperative multiplayer game, and you shoot the devil. It's interesting. Speedrunners is a um, combative multiplayer, so you're playing against each other, and, and you have to run around in a loop over and over again until one of you wins eventually. And then Space Team is one that you play in real life with your phones. Have you played Space Team? Yeah. Play Space Team. That's My talk is over. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> So, um, couch co-op co -op in particular, if you can call any of these couch co-op, uh, became popular again because it's this nostalgia milking enterprise which is super fashionable right now. You've got remakes of games, uh, you've got uh, like the new Super Mario games which are all couch co-op and that kind of thing. And it's the things you used to play as a child and you're playing them again now and you're playing them in new ways, which is why local multiplayer is so interesting right now. Uh, so yeah, uh, these games are built on a foundation of nostalgia. Uh, you've got Speedrunners, which is a sort of arcade-style local multiplayer. You've got Towerfall and Broforce, which are um, pixelated and kind of, let's see, Towerfall, there we go, and Speedrunners. So Speedrunners has got like arcade-style controls and simplicity, and Towerfall is very pixelated and very sort of old school. And that's because they are uh, playing on your nostalgia, which is the whole point of the first part of this talk. So, you may have noticed at the moment that nostalgia is pretty lucrative. You've got, like I said, remakes of all the Zelda games. Breath of the Wild is basically the first Zelda game, but big. Uh, and you've got... Uh, where are we? Yeah. And you've got people being very mad that nostalgia is ruining video games! It's not, FYI. <laughs> it's actually making them way better. 
Um, but everyone's very angry that things are being repeated. And I think the problem with nostalgia is that it's taking advantage of the sort of millennial desire to never grow up. Uh, but we can't afford to grow up. We can't afford houses or families or taxes. So why not pretend like we're children forever? Because we basically are. But that's a talk for another day. <laughs> Here's what I love about the nostalgia of Couch Co-op. It takes you back to a time before the internet when things were simple. And, well, they weren't actually simple. We just weren't reading the news and caring about politics at that time. But they felt simple. You know, when we were children and everything, you didn't have any responsibility except homework. And, yeah, you can miss homework. It's fine. Don't tell your children that. Um, and it makes us feel like everything's maybe okay in a time when it's definitely not... But more than that, it takes us back to a time before the internet when connecting with people was more personal and more intimate. But I don't want to get all like, oh, the internet's made everything terrible and it's made socializing really bad because it hasn't. It's made it easier and way nicer. It's just very different to when we were children. So let me tell you about Johann Sebastian Joust. Who's played Joust? Yay. More of you need to play Joust. Joust and Space Team, write them down. <laughs> So there's this thrill I get from playing a game of Joust, which you can't really get from most other games. And here's what happens when Joust gets played. So you're sitting in a room of people, normally eating pizza or something very normal, and someone runs in, sweat running down their face, and yells, Joust! And everyone in the room turns to them and yells, Joust! In return... And then you all play a game of Joust. Now, that's the way I've experienced it. I'm sure that there's actually like a protocol, but I'm pretty sure that's how it happens. So here is what Joust is. I've picked this picture, which is very unhelpful because you can't actually see, but okay. So up to, I think, eight people can play Joust at any given time. And what you do is you hold a PlayStation Move controller, if you imagine this is a controller, and you hold it like this, upright. Or, well, you can hold it another way, but you shouldn't, and here's why. Play, uh, PlayStation? PlayStation Joust. Um, joust is about jostling. It is the only video game I know of where you can use the word jostling and be like, yes, that is the correct word, even though you sound like a grandma. And the trick of the game is to jostle everyone else, and if you've jostled everyone, then you are the winner of Joust. And the PlayStation Move controllers can sense when you're being jostled. So this is a game of Joust. Um, played throughout an evening, I guess, and you can see that all the PlayStation Move controllers have a different color, and everybody has different tactics, and you can actually tell from this photo what their tactics are. You can see yellow is going all around the outside of the room, like, don't touch me, don't jostle me, I don't want to be jostled, I'm just here to have fun. You can see that red is just sort of running all over the place and being like, jostling, and having a great time, I guess. I don't know who won. I hope it's yellow. They seem to be in the longest or blue, or purple. I don't know. Anyway, this is a nice picture, so there you go. So if you get jostled, you lose. And the other thing about Johann Sebastian Joust, as you might be able to tell from the title, is that it plays bark tunes. Bark, bark, block, bark. Um, and when it plays them slowly, that means the controllers are super sensitive. And when it plays it quickly, it means they're not as sensitive. So when you're playing it slowly, everyone's sort of like this, like sharks circling each other. This is what sharks look like. I've never seen a shark. And when it plays fast, everyone's just pushing and kicking and throwing things at each other. And I do know people who have lots of different tactics. That's gang beasts. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> uh, I know people who pick up brooms and poke people with it because that counts as jostling. I know people who hide behind sofas, and those people are me. That tactic doesn't work. FYI, I have never won a single game of joust but I have a tactic, and that counts for something. And I know people who, as you can see, just run around the room pushing people. It's a very physical game, and it's quite an intimate one because you're looking each other in the eye all the time. And that's why I'm going to talk about Gang Beasts. Uh, with exciting games like Gang Beasts, which is a great game, and I wanted to get this picture of costumes, but I also found out that sexy fan art... <laughs> Back to the costumes. Um... Gang Beast is great. It's a very good local multiplayer game. Same with Towerfall and same with Speedrunners and lots of others that I can't be bothered to mention, but they're all over there pretty much, so there you go. Gang Beast is great, but everyone you're playing it with, you don't look them in the eye. You talk to each other. Well, you yell at each other and you have a great time, but you're not looking at each other. There's no real sense of uh, playing with the person that you're sitting next to. You're just playing with a chicken or a fox. And 
sometimes there's a sense of like who you're playing with because some games have like names and you can pick costumes so you know who's who, but there's no real intimacy there. There we go. But with Joust, you're looking each other in the eye all the time. That's one of the tactics as well, is trying to intimidate people by like looking at them and being like, yeah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to fight me? Are you gonna, you're going to jostle me? Go ahead. Make my day. I don't play it like that. I hide. I hide is how I play it. Um, but I really like these sort of local multiplayer games that, unlike the ones we played as children and the ones we played, I don't know, five years ago, they're about people. They're not about the games. They're about enabling people to be intimate in social situations. So now I'm going to talk about Bounden. Have any, has anyone heard of Bounden? Sweet. Cool. Uh, so Bounden is a game about dancing. It's designed in uh, cooperation with actual dancers, ballet dancers, and they help design the game. So uh, it's kind of hard to tell from the screenshot, but what you see here is two men very awkwardly dancing with each other. And what you see here is the game they're playing. So you've got this sphere, and it's, it's synced up with the accelerometer in your phone. Uh, two people have to hold on to, there's a circle over there, that's where you put your thumb. So people have their thumbs on opposite sides of the phone. And then they move this sphere around to line up that ball with that circle there. And as you can imagine, well, as you can see, it leads to things like this. It's meant to look graceful. It doesn't always. And recently, I played this game in a sports bar in San Francisco with a bunch of men watching basketball, baseball, one of the balls games. And... I played it with this guy that I'd known for like a day. And then we went on a date two days later because that's what Bounden does. It makes people feel intimate with each other. It's a sort of shared connection. It's a physicality and it's, it's a very good game. And I think everybody should play it. That's another one to add to your list. There you go. Uh, oh dear. Okay. Uh, shameless plug. This is my game. <laughs> Uh, so the guy who made Bounden also made a game called Friendstrap, which it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, is very similar to the game I made, uh, Awkward Dating Simulator, which is a game designed because I had to, because I was doing a course, but also because I wanted to. I wanted to make a game that was about physical intimacy and making people kiss. I wanted to make a game where people kiss. I don't think anyone's kissed yet, but I can't guarantee that. Someone played this on a date once. So maybe they have. I should tell you what it is. Awkward Dating Simulator is a game that's based on the 36 questions to make you fall in love, which is not that. It's that. On the New York Times, which means it's legit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the 36 questions that lead to love is basically a list of incredibly personal and awkward questions. It starts off with things like, how's your day been? What do you feel grateful for? And things like that. And it goes into... Who in your family would you be most sad if they died? Which is a really hard question to answer. My mum. Um, <laughs> that's not necessarily true. If you're watching this on YouTube, family, all of you is who it is. Please don't die. Oh, my God. <laughs> Reel it back. Okay. So at the top, it asks you the questions. It starts off with the calm boring things and it moves into the horribly personal politics, religion, family, past relationship stuff that you're told not to talk about. And by squishing all of that into about 15 minutes, it makes your brain, it tricks your brain into thinking that you're incredibly intimate with this person. And it weirdly works. I've made strangers hold hands. These people aren't strangers, but they're holding hands. And that's nice. Um, I've also had because I didn't put any instructions in the game, I've also had a lot of people let's play it on their own and not really know what they're supposed to do. It runs on a timer. So there's this little bar at the bottom just steadily going down, and they're like, what does it mean? Why is it telling me to adjust my clothes? Ah. And there's also no buttons in the game apart from escape, which just takes you back to the start. So they're sitting there going like, space, arrows, how do I win? You can't win. <laughs> I win. So, <laughs> so <laughs> what am I talking about? So this is what games are doing now. It's a really interesting thing to see, especially in indie games, and sometimes in Nintendo games, not really in Xbox, and sometimes in PlayStation, which is basically that they're trying to foster a sense of community and empathy and friendship. 
and I couldn't find a picture to illustrate friendship, so I drew one. Yay. <laughs> Local multiplayer used to be this simple thing where you'd go around to your friend's house and you'd play Smash Bros, you'd play Mario Kart, you'd play something like that and you'd all have controllers and you'd have a fun time. But it was a fun time with the game and then with yourselves. And the way they're doing it now with local multiplayer is that it's a fun time enabled by the game, but it's with friends. It's things like Space Team, it's things like Boundin and what's the other one I mentioned? Joust, that's the one. And it's also like, I mean, how many of you have played single-player games with a friend, even though they can't really do anything? Yay! I've been playing Breath of the Wild with, with my housemates, and it's great, and also it slightly ruins the game, because I see all the secrets before they happen, and then I go and play it, and I'm like, oh, I've already seen this. But it's fine. It's a fun experience. I played through Majora's Mask the same way. I played Ocarina of Time with my brother. That's how I play Zelda games, and... I think that's totally legit, but games are branching out from that. They're branching out from the two-player, three-player, four-player games we used to play as kids, and they're now trying to make us feel things, fall in love even. And I think the reason that is, is that they're trying to make us feel playful, like when we were children. That's the thing that I reminisce about the most, is it's not the not having responsibility, it's not the having nothing better to do but play games all day with your friends. It's not that every day feels like a summer holiday, when it's the summer holiday anyway, not at school. It's not that, it's the fact that you were playful when you were a kid. You didn't have things to worry about, so all you thought about was, what can I do with this? How can I make this a game? And when there are games that encourage playfulness and that make us feel like children again, uh, that's a good thing. I forgot where I was going with this. That's a good thing. Thank you, bye. <laughs>